Welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast from the Tatai Club in Greece. Today I get the amazing opportunity to interview super agent Max Eisenbud, who managed Sharapova from a young 11 years of age. He also looked after Lina, looks after Emirata Kanu, and he's a great team of agents over here at the Club Tatai. I've been very fortunate to be brought here by AIMG, and it's been an amazing experience having 48 of the world's best juniors under 12s here and speaking to the parents and we've posted so many of these players on functional tennis and to be able to talk to them is absolutely amazing so it's been loads of fun here max has taken some time out of his super busy schedule to jump in on a podcast interview with us and yeah you're going to hear some good stories great advice and a bit about the img future stars tournament here and how we'll be back next year and yes, yeah, so stay tuned for that, coming in very shortly. Also, uh, before we start, a shout out to our podcast sponsors, Slinger Bag, who make the awesome portable ball machine, the Slinger Bag. You can head over to slingerbag.com to get all the information on the Slinger Bag. Last thing to note, really important thing, I've spent nearly, you could say, 16, 17 months working on the Functional Tennis Sabre, our new training tool and it's now available on pre-order it was showcased just a few days ago pre-order went live and if you go to functionaltennis.com forward slash saber or just google functional tennis saber you will see our new training tool it's an amazing product we've had players tested such as stan vervinka with yubi hercat this week over here tested him and his coach loved it and yeah go over check it out let me know what you think it's on pre-order at the moment the chips in late may and it's on pre-order till then and yeah let me know what you think but now let's get straight into this conversation with max Hi. welcome to the functional tennis podcast this is my first ever time really on location somewhere to to meet somebody a superstar agent in this case but yeah how are you very good thanks uh Thanks for being here yourself and everything that you do for junior tennis. So I'm really uh, glad to sit here and have a nice conversation. That's amazing for me. We've been posting videos of some of these juniors. I saw Rafael Pagonis. We posted a video three and a half years ago. And he was great then. He was a player of the week. And it's great to be able to meet these parents and players. And it's down to you for giving me the opportunity to meet these. So many of them. There's so many of them here. So congrats on putting this together. But let's... We talk about a few things. One is about this tournament, obviously, IMG Future Stars here in Athens, Greece. Right. Two is a bit about your own journey. And you've managed players from 11 years old. Sure. One in particular we sure. talk about. So there's a lot that people can learn from you. And that's why you're in a good position to run a tournament like this because you know what these juniors really need. So first, let's talk about quickly a bit about your sure. tennis career before you became an agent. <laughs> I wouldn't put tennis and career and in the same sentence for me, but I mean, I I grew up uh, in in New Jersey in the United States and was a uh, you know a average junior tennis player. I was ranked top ten in my section and you know ranked around a hundred in the country as a junior. And uh, went to Purdue University on a tennis tennis scholarship. Had amazing four years. Loved my time at Purdue. Um, and towards the end of my my, my junior, senior year, I started to hear about somebody named Mark McCormack and started reading his books, uh, What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School, Staying Street Smart in the Internet Age. I can't even believe I can remember all the names, but read his books and uh, just fell in love with this guy, Mark McCormack, who, who was the first ever sports agent. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the time, I really had in the back of my mind that if you were... If you want to be a sports agent, you need to be a lawyer and you need to go to law school. And I wasn't probably the best student in the world and law school was probably not going to be for me. But then I started reading more and more and meeting some IMG tennis agents, going to tennis tournaments and trying to be around and started to hear, started to hear that, um, you know, that you don't need to go to law school to be a tennis agent. When I heard that, then I really became pretty obsessed with, okay, I want to try to work you know, for IMG and, and Mark McCormick. And I got that opportunity in 2000. Um, and yeah, and I've been here 22 years. And they can't get rid of me. <laughs> you're, you're in the paint war. Was Mark there when you were there? Yeah. Like, I've read the book myself. It's a, you know, it's a business, it's a book. You don't, it's only for tennis, it's for business no, leaders. Yeah, it's for I, would, I would encourage everyone to read all his books. 
um, the guy was so year, so many years ahead of everybody. Um, and I got the, I got, um, I was very fortunate to, to get to know him. I started my career actually at IMG Academy in Bradenton. Okay. He was spending a lot of time down there. Um, we played a lot of tennis together. I got to know him. Um, real honor to uh, to get to know him and, and for several first couple of years of my career before he passed. I'm sure you've learned a lot from him, but is there one thing that sticks out in particular? You know, the one thing I love about him is that he used to travel to Asia a lot and he never wanted to be jet lagged. Okay. So he always put his meat, he would go in and out in 48 hours and he would just, the people had to come meet him at his time. Wow. Um, so he was never jet lagged. Um, I remember he always would have a, a, a index card with him and, and write notes on an index card. Um, and the next time I would see him, he would remember my kid's name because if he knows he's going to see somebody, he would read the card and know what he talked about and stuff. So just his attention to detail wow. was very impressive. And I think that's something I've tried to keep with me. He's way ahead of the sales force of these days where you ring up a business and they know you're deep. They remember your birthday. They all yes. document yeah, it. That's a newer thing now. Yeah, he, he's, he, was, he was an incredible man. Yeah, really incredible. So yeah, that's a great privilege for you to work under him. And so you were at IMG at the academy there. And how did that progress? You came across a, a good junior. Well, yeah, I mean, actually the story goes, I was actually supposed to uh, move and start my career in, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where IMG's headquarters were. And I was getting ready to move there. And, and then I got a phone call from the executive who hired me saying that the change of plans, that they're going to send me to Bradenton, Florida and IMG Academy. And there was a lot of young players down there. And so I went there and I met on the first day, Maria Sharapova, 11 years old. Just total luck, was it, that she, you met her, she was based there a she while. Was, she was based there. And she was, I was still playing pretty good tennis at the time. I think I was maybe like 26 or 27. I, and I can remember watching her practice the first day. I was like, I, I've never seen intensity. 45 minutes, the ball never hitting the net, never needing a, okay. a, some water. And I was just blown away. This girl was so skinny and intense. Got to, you know, they were having some, you know, visa issues and different things. I was just there in the right time. I got to know them, build relationship with her father, started playing tennis with her. After six months, they really were relying on me. And the rest is history. I've been st I'm still manager to this day. Wow. And this, is, is that how players and agents come together, really, where they help each other? You know, you're assigned players and you help them out and it's a long-term relationship. Yeah, I mean, there's no cookie-cutter way that it works. Yeah. It's certainly not normal. You know, I'm sure we'll discuss it a little later. It's not a normal situation when a 11 year old and an agent are together. I mean, that's a very yeah. rare thing. She was a rare athlete that at that age was very special. So, you know, it, it's all about building trust. I was in the right place at the right time. I could still play tennis, so I was practicing with her. They had, they needed, you know, help with a lot of different things. And I was just doing basic things to make their life easier. And that's how the trust yeah. You know, bills and you're having a couple of beers with the dad at night and you're talking and it just, it, it wasn't like I saw her and I'm like, oh my God, I need to be her manager. I, my, my, I was just trying to make her life easier. Yeah. And, and, and then before you know it, she's holding a Wimbledon trophy. Well, what did that feel like for you? Being in the, were you in the box that day? Sure. I mean, that's, there was a six years between when I met her to that, but I mean, that was a, Pretty special moment. I mean, her life changed forever, and so did mine. And we, well, we know it hurt. Her has changed. I know there's more pressure, more commitments, more people reaching out. But how much extra work does it give you as an agent when every brand in the world wants to work? And no different to Emma Raducanu. Sure. Now. I mean, I had a. I mean, when you work at a company like IMG, there's a lot of amazing experts. And at that time, I was. She won Wimbledon. I was still young, so I was leaning on a lot of people within our organization that have gone through it. Um, and that's what makes IMG pretty special. So there was a team of eight or 10 people, still a team of that many people that are involved in, in all of her business. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, the, I call it like the quarterback or I'm the pilot of the plane. I'm just trying to get all the experts and all the right people. I get a lot of credit um, for a lot of things that, just because I'm her responsible agent, but there's a 
huge team of people. And the same with Emma Raducanu. I mean, there's a 10, 15 people within our organization that are helping. Everyone's seeing the deals that are being done, but there's so many different people. That's not, every deal is not done by me and Chris Hellier. There's 10 other people that are, are involved. And our job is to make sure that the experts are, are within our company are being brought in to do the deal. And how much time does a player have to spend with your team to get these deals done? Or is it done with their parents at such a young age? Uh, I mean, you know, Maria was 17, Emma was 18. They're, at that time, they're, they're pretty sophisticated, smart girls. So they, they, it's hard to keep them out of everything. But it's a, it's a timing of when to bring them in. You're working with their parents. You're, you, and then when, you, when it's at the right time, you bring them in for their opinion and, final, and their final uh, decision on it. And you explain to them. Both girls are very bright. Both girls have a very strong opinion on where they want to go, what they're looking to do. Both girls are great listeners, um, want to know all the information. So I'm, you know, I've been very, very fortunate in my life. And you throw in Lena, who's another, you know, amazing. So I've gone, I've been lucky in my career to go through, you know, a Sharapova win at 17, a Lena historic win at France, where 116 million people in China are watching her win. And then the Emma, Emma, amazing run. So I'm been pretty lucky, a lot of lucky guy. A lot of home runs yeah. there. And would somebody like Emma come to you and say, look, I want to, I love Gucci, I want to work with Gucci. I want to, is that the way it works sometimes or do you present them? I mean, times? we have a, we have a pretty good understanding of, of what brand she likes or, or we usually go in categories. Like she won, let's, we're going to do something in fashion. What are the best brands in fashion? I think you probably know that she did a, a global deal with Dior. Um, and um, we had m several offers in the in the fashion beauty space okay. besides Dior. Um, and then you get the offers and then you present them to her and her family. And I think they were pretty excited with Dior. Yeah. Pretty special. Uh, Porsche was one I saw. Yeah, I Porsche. didn't know. I wasn't sure about the Dior one. It yeah. was a fashion one, but Porsche is a... I love Porsche. Like, yeah, I Porsche is a good one. I mean, Porsche is, I mean, she's act, Porsche really makes sense because she loves, you know, motorsports and oh, well. she loves F1 and she loves, and she knows cars, she knows engines. So really? that was a, that was a no brainer. That's a nice one. Yeah. Nice one. But yes, yeah, so that must be like amazing to have this, but let's go to the, the journey today for sure. these young kids. Like sure. We're here at, in beautiful place at the Thai Club in Greece, probably the most spectacular tennis resort I've ever been at. Now it's more than a tennis resort, but it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, the people that are listening are not going to be able to appreciate because I've been watching videos and seeing pictures of this club for 18 months. And until I walked in here and saw it, I mean, this place is very special. Yeah. I, I, people are going to need to trust me and you. Yeah. No, that this place is special. It's what, there's like 15, 16 tennis courts yeah. here minimum. There's so much space. Yeah. You can walk around. The architecture, the way the courts are built. Yeah. This place is very special, and, and uh, you know, again, I'm very appreciative that you could be here and, and see it yourself. Yeah, no, it's thank you again. And Maria Sakari based herself here when she's in Greece. Yes. She's, oh, they built it as a tennis facility initially, I think. Yeah. And But, yeah, it's just beautiful. Anyway, we're here for the IMG Future Stars, sure. which you've selected, you and your team, your great team. I know Lu Luik has done a great job helping mainly overseeing this, yes. really. 48 of the best under 12s in the world yeah how does that selection process that how do you pick 48 of the best juniors in the world uh -huh. luckily i didn't pick them so i mean to, to step back a little bit i mean this was you know we make our, our our living representing the best players in the world um and we used to go to the great junior tournament in tarbes and in, in uh in france for 14 and under historically great junior event and we would go there as a IMG and our recruiting, our agents and our scouts would go there, spot the talent, build relationships, eventually try to sign the players if we think they're going to be great pros. Uh, for the last eight or ten years, you would go do that and the players were already signed. They already had clothing deals. So we're like, okay, we need to go earlier. Listen, nobody wants to recruit and sign 10 and 11 and 12-year-old kids. I mean, it's not... It's not what anybody wants to do, but unfortunately our livelihood is on representing the best players in the world. So when we were going to Tarbes and, and 
we were late, things were already happening. We we're like the, I mean, the next best thing is we got to go earlier. So we were, you know, have a bunch of amazing young agents. It's the best we've ever had. And they, you know, they were the ones that came and like, listen, we need to, maybe we should look at doing our own event or we should partner with a 12 and under event. Um, Loic, which is uh, Martin, one of our young agents based in France, is doing a lot of the recruiting, found the Tatoy Club. And that we started talking to them about the idea. They loved the idea. Um, and then we're like, let's create our own event and let's, let's scout, build relationships and let's try to get the best juniors in the world. Now it's hard because yeah. you're doing a lot on video and you don't see, but so we put a selection committee together, a bunch of the young agents, maybe five or six. They went out and looking at videos. I think you were responsible for your amaze what you do. Um, you have a ton of fans and a bunch of videos. So we saw a lot of, I think a lot of the players here maybe are from because of you. Am I on a cut? No, you're not. <laughs> you get a you get an extra you get an extra racket when you're here, um, but yeah. So you know we just went to work and 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 tried to bring the you know the very best. Now there's probably a lot of players that we miss that are going to be great pros, and we want to still have relationships with them as well. But we're trying our best. Um, and even beyond the tennis, and I think you've seen here, I think it's really important for your listeners to know that this is not the typical tennis week. Like the competition is great, but more important than the competition, and, and I think you can vouch for everyone, like after the match is over, like no one's allowed to practice. There's educational workshops. Yesterday we had the WTA and the ATP here speaking to the parents and the coaches and the kids about what life is like on WTA and ATP. Um, today is going to be a master class by Ricardo Piatti for all the coaches, which I think is going to be great. Um, we have a social media tomorrow, I think, teaching the kids the importance of social media, how to be safe with using social media, why social media is important. So, yes, the competition is important, but we're using this week as an opportunity for the coaches, the parents, and the kids to get an education because they're on a path to become a pro. A lot needs to happen. But that path can be difficult. And so we're hoping they leave here this week with a lot of tools um, to help their help it to be better. You know, and so yes, we're looking we're our scouts, our agents are here to to look at the talent, to build relationships. Maybe we sign a player, maybe we don't. But you know, at eleven years old, you're monitoring the player, maybe in six months they grow, they have a girth, a growth spurt. But it's about building relationships, trying to give back. And one thing and a lot of people say, oh, big, bad IMG, they're always involved in everything. But we're always trying to do what's good for the sport. Like we've been in tennis for since McCormick. And we want to, what's good for tennis is good for IMG. And so, you know, we want, we could have easily just brought the kids here, had the competition, roll the balls out, see who's good. Yeah. But we really wanted to go above that. We brought Alcaraz and Hubi here to have an exhibition the kids got to see them, they interacted. What an amazing opportunity for the kids to see two of our clients playing, um, the education. So the relationships that the kids are gonna be, you know, so there's a lot of great things happening here that I'm really proud of. Um, another thing I wanna mention is that there's a round robin format. So everyone's guaranteed three matches and you can't leave. You're, if you come to our tournament, you're here for the week and you have to be here to get the education and everything, you can't lose and leave. Uh, we'll pay for rooms for the ho for the parents and the coaches because we want the coaches to come here. So this is a different this is a different uh, event. We're really proud of it in year one, and we're hoping to build this and hope to see some more of your fans that are come to your you know great destination. And hopefully we'll see them next year. So you're you're going to have another one. You're yeah. to have another one. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is going to be something that we do for a long time. Yeah. Just being here the first few days, and I think you'll agree that it's pretty special. Oh look, it's amazing. I was just going to say, like I spoke to some of the coaches yesterday and I know the education yesterday from the ATP and WTA was for more the kid. Yeah. But the coaches thought it was amazing. Yeah. They were like, this is great information and they were really happy with it. And I know today there's even a court experience with Herkat and yeah. his coach. Yes. And who else? Somebody else jumping in as well. Bagdad. Oh, Bagdad, Marcus. Is, yeah, he's been so nice as yeah. well. He's been here floating around and one thing is, 
like I've, I didn't know I knew some of the agents I knew Matt and I knew uh, who else kind of Louis of mm-hmm. course but I didn't know Carter mm-hmm. and a few of the others and look they're so open you can up and ask them anything yeah. I do know some of them can still play Carter yeah we, we, our court. agents our agents are good players yeah. so, listen we, we've got great people that work in our company and I actually will tell you the one thing I love about the tennis industry, there's a lot of there's a lot of good people in our in our in our uh, industry, and that's other agencies. Uh, the, it's very pleasant to work in the tennis industry. A lot of good people. Um, yeah, I'm proud of our young agents that are here. They're doing a great job. Uh, Marcus Batdadis, thank you for bringing him up. I mean, he's been a longtime client of ours. My colleague Marion Ball manages him, and he's made him the tournament director, and he's gone above and beyond. I mean, he loves it. He's recruiting. Yeah. He's talking to the coaches. Uh, the kids are excited that he's here. So, you know, it feels like family. You know, you have two of our clients playing an exhibition. We have an old client, our continued uh, old player legend, who's the tournament director. So it's it's a special week. Um, it's gone better than I can imagine. And the Tatoya Club is just, they've been such amazing partners of ours um, and taking this to another level. I mean, have you seen the app? Are you... Yes, yeah, so I have to use the app. You have to use the app. I'm commentating here. Okay, so that, I mean, we have there, there's probably no better tennis app no. in the world, and it's at our junior event. Yeah, that's right. A, and, everything is, and that and the club is the one who developed that app. Yeah. So I know people are like, "What do you mean they have an app?" But so I mean, so when you come to our event, you have a you, you download an app. It's just for our event, and that has all the players' pictures, profiles, coaches, where they're from. Uh, court assignments, alerts. It's yeah. pretty amazing. The alerts are good because get your ass over there. Yeah. You know, because you, know, you have to move a large amount of people. Yeah. But one thing I did notice was, it was funny last night, that, you know, you say tennis stops at three yesterday, you can't play tennis after that, you go to your ATP to be education, then the kids had games to play. Yeah. And it was, the setup was amazing. I didn't even know that part of the club existed. Yes. And they're playing games and they were so into it. And they were just kids, they're kids, like yeah. they're young kids, and yeah. you forget that. And some of the parents were dragging the kids on. The kids were like, No, I want to stay and play with my friends yeah. here. And just, uh, I was just, it was just, wasn't, didn't feel like a tennis tournament yeah. at all. It was just like kids on holidays. Yeah, you thank you say. for bringing that up because the club also did a, an Olympics theme yesterday mm-hmm. where all the kids were competing for two hours in Olympic. You know, yeah. racing and different things, and it was so fun to see them. I think a lot of relationships are being built here, and I think that's also another part of that makes me really excited about the event. Yeah, because some of these kids are saying, Sebastian Lavi, one of the coaches, saying some of these kids could be playing each other in 10 years' time in the WTA ATP events. Like, people forget that when these tennis players are playing at these high level events, they've been, they've been playing each other since they're young kids. Yes. And, the relationship goes deeper than just their match on the yes. court today. And I think many people don't know that. And this is where it starts for yeah. a lot of them. So you're giving them a great opportunity. And once you get into that, you could say it's a club or get to know these people. Sure. It helps you stay on top of your game. And also, what I've learned, I've never really, I've never been to an event like this. I've been to pro events. It just shows what's needed. Like, work is needed to be the best. Yes. And, you know, I've spoken to getting to know players, their profiles. Some play from eight, nine hours to 15, 16, but they're doing the prehab, they're doing the warm-ups, they're doing the cool-downs, they're serious players, yeah. and like, I've seen one of the Spanish kids was just, the guy looks like a pro, yeah. already. but off the court then, they're nice, and they're yes. friendly, and they're playing table tennis, so the mix is good, and the people are Yeah, nice. I mean, to get to this event, you have to be at a high level, yeah. right, and you've had to work really hard, um, but that hard work, and then to be able to see them at, you know, being regular kids is, is, is rewarding. Yeah. But I think it's good for the kids to see other kids. Yes. The level, the work they're putting in, because if you don't put in the work, yeah. it's all, yeah. you're not going anywhere yeah. really. And that's, I think it's an important message to tell parents that the work has to go into this. Totally. And so you're going to have an event next year, which is amazing. People will be able to apply online. Sure. And then it's a pro. It's so we had, a, I mean, it's, we had um, an open, anyone could enter. Yeah. I think, you know, since it's the first year, not everyone saw yeah. or we tried to get it to a lot of people. I know you were promoting it. Thank you so much. Um, I think now people, we're going to get a lot more entries. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that player that's somewhere out there that we, we don't know and give them the opportunity. I mean, we have players here from Pakistan and China and New Zealand and South Africa. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. So hopefully... Uh, with your help of promoting event and and people seeing it that we'll have even more and more 
difficult decisions. Yeah. I mean, we want to have difficult decisions. We want to have more videos. We want to scout. We want to see. We want to make this the best event. I have a feeling the level is very high this year, but I think after this year with people seeing it, it's going to be very difficult to get in. Yeah, it's going to be even higher. Yeah. They're going to have to raise their game. Yeah. It's going to get hurt by I saw, I'm really bad with names. So there's just so many new names I've yeah. had to take in here. But I saw uh, just a Chinese yes. girl play there and I was commentating and backhand was incredible. Amazing, like, right? I mean, just absolutely. How the ball amazing. comes off her racket. It's just yeah, amazing. flat and hard. And yeah. then they can spin as well, yeah. drop shot, they can mix it up. Yeah, and It's even, like watching little mini pros. There's a cool, there's a match going on right now that when before we walked over here, it's two and a half hours and these kids, these two, they're going to play together on the pro tour. The way they're playing. Yeah. There was a boy from Czech, a boy from Germany. Czech boys. And, yeah. and they're just battling out there. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's great. Do you wish you were a young 10-year-old with the opportunity like this? No, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, these, I think these kids are at a different level of athleticism than where I was. But uh, I can appreciate just being on my side of it. And tell me, what's been, just a couple more questions sure. for you. What's been your favorite moment as an agent? with one of the players you've worked with. Is there anything that stands out apart from your first Wimbledon title? I mean, it's not, I get to ask this question a lot. It's not a moment of Maria one match point or Lena one match point or Emma did this. I think the most rewarding thing for me is to work with some amazingly strong women who before I started with them had very little money mm. and now they have a lot of wealth. Yeah. For generations to to forever, and I was a maybe a small part of helping them yeah. with their dreams, and and that's rewarding to me. And were you CEO of Sugarpova <laughs> and agent oh, on your day job? We, we uh, Marie and I always joke about. It. I mean, Sugarpova was uh, something that Marie and I started together. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, she says that I was a self-appointed CEO. Okay. At the end of the day, Maria Sharapova was always the CEO of everything that she's doing. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, that's been a, a great project for her and for us and, and, again, very rewarding. And did I read somewhere that you're a master of saying no? A master of saying no. It's an important one of most I'm pretty important. good at saying no. And how important is it to say no? Yeah, so I think some of the best deals I've done are the ones that I, we didn't do. Okay. Um, listen, when you're, when you, uh, Maria, when she won that match point, her life changed forever. And when you're around a young person, when their life changes, they really hold on tight to the people that were before they were famous. Um, I've never become famous, but I can only, I've seen people become famous and it's, it's not an easy thing to deal with. All of a sudden, people look at you differently, but you're the same person. And when you're going through that when you're young, it's a little scary. Um, and I was thrusted into this, uh, this job to protect this young girl who just became very famous and saying no was a very big part of that. So I, I, I actually haven't heard that, but I can understand where a lot of people, if they were talking about me, I think they know that I'm, when you talk to me, I'm a very straight shooter and you're gonna get a direct answer. And I think people respect that about me and appreciate that about me, but it's never fun giving people information that they don't wanna hear. I mean, I had to fire Jimmy Connors one time. That was really oh, nerve wracking. Yeah. Was he was on your books? Wasn't no, he, he was a Maria work. Sharapova's coach for a couple well, you weeks. Had to, you were given the task. Yeah, so that was scary. Um, so how did he take it? He was a pro. He was fine, okay. but I was nervous. <laughs> um, he yeah, he was fine, but yeah, I mean, you when you're the agent and you're in charge of these, you know, these young talented kids you have to step up and sometimes protect them and, and, and be that bad person yeah. or that tough person to give the information that people don't want to hear. It's, look, it's a, great, it's a great skill to have and you can cut out a lot of the crap and stop wasting people's time. And yeah. I think it's an unbelievable skill for any person to have, which a lot of people don't have. Yeah. But what advice do you have? We have a lot of parent listeners sure. and 
what advice do you have for young parents, with parents with young kids who are, I don't know, 10, 12, 13, who, the kids have dreams. Every kid here wants to be world number yeah. one. I mean, the uh, Maria's dad was the most amazing, um, and I would call him the, you know, the gold standard of developing a, a young player. Um, Maria never practiced six, eight hours a day. He demanded short practices that were intense. Um, and I believe in that, especially when you're young and you're growing. Like no one needs to be playing six hours of tennis a day. I think that um, every practice had a purpose. There was something that they were working on that he would articulate that day, a purpose, a reason why, and it was always intense. He was never afraid to cancel practices. He was very good at reading that she's tired. If they Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and he can see in her face, Thursday needs to be an off day, he'll cancel practice. Yeah. Um, play a lot of tournaments on the weekends, local tournaments, a lot of matches, competing. Never, ever, ever, ever talked about winning play the right tennis. He would yell at her more for playing safe or just hoping to win or hoping that the other person was gonna miss. Mm -hmm. He wanted her to dictate and play and play on her terms and miss, have good misses. Yeah. Because he think he always believed that as she got older, they would fall. And I was witness to all this. Um, he, um, Brought his daughter to all different experts. Wasn't worried that this one would be upset that he was, he didn't care. <laughs> okay, like if I think this is best for my daughter, if I'm at Nick Volatari's and I'm getting here, but I'm going to go to Robert Landstorp in California, I don't care if Volatari's <laughs> mad about Landstorp. I don't care if Landstorp's mad about Volatari. This is what I need for my daughter. Nice. Um, and I had a front row seat to this unbelievable development and this unbelievable bond between the bond that they had and they continue to have, people saw him as intense and met the matches he was intense. And, but the love and the bond that they had, I think if your parents are listening, that's the most important. Under, understanding your... Yeah, theory. understanding. But, the, but when the tennis is all over and done and the kids have, and the kids have families, you want to make sure that you're a part of that. Yeah. Don't screw up this you know, for the other. Don't have a relationship with your kid that just, and it's not easy because I know if you look at it, every great player has a strong parent and the parents do most of the time do a great job. But what I witnessed uh, with the young Sharapova was, uh, you know, a great, you know, a, a loving father who put everything on the line, but her health and everything was first. Nice. And, and I think that stayed true all the way through and I think that's one of the reasons why she was able to have success yeah. and pretty long career There's a lot of, yeah a lot of wisdom there yeah. I was I did, sorry two things I have seen keep going I got time I have seen uh, I've been spoken to a lot of parents and kids and I've also been monitoring their interaction and you can see that all parents and kids the relationship is different somewhere the coaches are not yeah. and it's quite interesting to see I'm not going to say anything here but it's just me just seeing how they all interact and how the kids react, but that's one. Two, Anthony Harris, who's mm -hmm. here, the coach of yeah. Light Harris, decided to not travel with Light Harris to be here, which is pretty an am amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, and he was saying one of his kids, two kids here, and one of his kids lost, I think six in the third yesterday. But he said to him it was a win because the kids stuck to his guns. He said tiebreak, he was pounding, pounding, yeah. six all tiebreak, pounding, yeah. seven six pounding. Yeah. He stuck to his guns. He lost, but. For him, that was a win. Yeah. And I know the kid was upset for a while, but that's the kid. But my final thing I'm going to say now is something you said to the day, which I think is important. You probably re reiterate here and tell the people that you said that sometimes the guys that are winning today and girls are the ones that are when they're 18. They're saying they used to beat that guy. Yeah. Maybe you can tell it better than I did. Well, I mean, I, I just, you know, I was telling the kids on the opening day that, first of all, Come here and show your best tennis. Don't worry about winning or losing. Mm. And I really believe in that because many times the people that are winning in the 12 and unders are not winning 
when they're 18 because they're too worried about results. And it's another thing I tell the parents, like, it doesn't matter what you rank in the juniors if you're trying to be a pro tennis player, right? So d develop your game, play your best tennis. Don't worry about winning loss. Show your, show your skills out there. And quite frankly, when I'm recruiting, I start recruiting at three all in the third set. Like that's when I want to see the player. Like is that player at three all in the third pushing the ball, hoping that the other person's going to miss? Or is that person trying to dictate? Like I believe in good misses. Like if you're going for the shot, you're going, you know, going, you believe in it. I like that better than oh, I'm just going to push the ball and hope the other person misses. Because when you get to the pros, you're not gonna, if you push the ball, yeah. it's over. So I believe in that and, and, and told the kids that. And I think that's, you know, the results, the rankings, it doesn't matter what if you're number one in the 12 and unders. And I think there's a lot of kids that go down the wrong path. Their parents are obsessed with winning, 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 winning. Now they get to 18. They can't. The other mm -hmm. kids have passed them because they developed their game. And those kids are telling, you know, I was telling the thing. Those kids are telling that I used to beat that guy. Yeah, we had Sebastian Lavi from Australia. Or New Zealand was beside me. He goes, after you said that, he goes, I am that kid. He goes, he used to be like Pierre Huber, six love, six love back when he was like 11, 12. And sure enough, when he was 18, he was, you know, he was, was the other way around. Yeah. He goes, he was a prime example of being that kid. So I think it was an important thing that's not all about winning. It's about no. trying your best and yeah. doing the right and, and especially in a tournament like this, like show your best tennis. Nobody here, if your goal is to impress an IMG scout, hopefully that's not your goal. You're just here to have fun and do it. But if that's your goal, we're seeing beyond wins and losses. Yeah. You know, I always tell, uh, you know, Madison Keys, she never, I don't think Madison Keys ever got past, she'll kill me if I get this wrong, <laughs> but I don't think she ever got past the quarterfinals of a junior grand slam. And she was hitting the ball hard and serving big and double faulting and going for her shots and losing to girls all the time. But, you know, her team just taught her, just keep, those balls will eventually fall in yeah. and just keep going for your shots. Yeah, you no. know, seven in the world, U.S. Open finalist, never got to the past the quarterfinals of a junior slam. She, all the girls that were just getting the ball in all the time would drive her nuts and beat her all the time. Yeah. But for her, she just always went, went for her shots, and, and, and then she became a great pro. Yeah, no, the truth, I've spoken to enough juniors on the podcast, or that went senior, they said, yeah, junior game is completely different to the pro game. Right. The pushers get found out, yeah. and the guys who even I think Dominic Team spent two years without winning anything because he was made go for balls. And yes. So yeah, so that's it. Look, uh, Max, this has been great. Uh, super thanks to be here. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be around Team IMG and Team Tatai, and also all the players and parents. For me, it's just as important to be around the players and parents. Sure. And yeah, that's it. Look, thank you so much. Year. I appreciate your involvement in the event. Hopefully, you'll come back with us next year. Will you commit? I will commit once I get the invite. <laughs> okay, yeah. you're invited. But thank you, and thank you to your audience for everything, and really appreciate what you do for junior tennis and everything, so thank you.